Hello, hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Schimmel. I'm the moderator for this panel on World Kid Lit Diversity in Publishing Children's Books. So, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the panel is going to talk about um, diversity, is one of those words that can mean so many different things. So, I mean, one of the things we are going to touch on is what it means for each of, each of the panelists. But um, we're going to be exploring a lot of the ways that um, the various panelists and publishing in general is bringing in books from other cultures, uh, either translating books, bringing in creators, uh, using an artist or an illustrator from, from different cultures, and also exploring um, and acknowledging that the UK is not a monolingual, monolithic culture, that it is a, a, a country with many languages. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce, um, immediately to my right is Delaram Ganimifard, okay, <laughs> the publisher of Tiny Owl. Um, next to her is Alice Curry, the publisher of Lantana. We have uh, seated next to her is Ruth Ahmedzai Kemp, um, who is a translator from uh, Russian, Arabic, and German, primarily. Um, and finally, we have Greet Powellain, okay, who is also a translator from Polish and is the publisher of Book Island. So, um, so to begin with, I'm just going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and um, what it is that, um, you know, their sort of manifesto or position statement on um, why they personally believe, support, and advocate for diversity in the books that they are publishing or translating. Uh, hello, my name is Delaram Ghanimi Far, um, publisher of Taniel. Um, in Tiny Owl, we uh, publish books that we believe are diverse and uh, multicultural. We um, actually, personally, uh, I started to think about publishing books, children books, when I came to this country and saw that my children at school were sitting in classrooms where there were children from many ethnic backgrounds. And uh, that was a reality, but in the book market, I couldn't find enough books that represented them. The books were white, and the schools were diverse. So that was the main thing that uh, made me start thinking about publishing diverse books and translated books. We started with translations. Uh, we believe that um, diversity is the right thing to do because diversity is reality and we, w we don't want to lie to children. We want them to see themselves in the books. We want, we want them to see others in the books as well. And uh, to, to see the uh, kind of reflection of the real society in books that they read and to imagine themselves in their own skin. So me as uh, non-white, uh, person. Um, when I was growing up, I had, uh, I was reading books that were princesses with blonde hair and uh, well, blue eyes. And for some years, I imagined myself being that girl. But that's actually not true. I mean, apart from princesses to be a role model. Um, that's something else. But seeing yourself as a hero in a book with another representation is just not right. So we want inclusivity, we want everybody. And diversity is not just about color, not about ethnicity. It's about disability, it's about sexuality, gender, it's about um, actually everything that makes us people of a society. Um, maybe if I just put a few statistics to what, to what Delaram is saying, so I agree with everything. Um, I mean, you, you're probably all familiar with the, with the survey that CLP did last year, right? The year before. Um, so, well, last year, based on books published in 2017, where only 4% um, of all children's books published that year featured uh, uh, BAME, black, Asian, minority, ethnic characters, and only 1% as heroes. Um, so it's, I mean, the statistics are incredibly stark when you then think that the UK's, uh, that the British, British school children in the UK, almost a third, I think it's 32.1% to be precise, of school children are BAME. And, and it's just, the statistics, honestly, they just speak for themselves. That, that makes no 
uh, ethical, social, moral sense, but also I don't think it makes any commercial sense. So I think it's important, you know, given that we're, we're publishing in a world where we have to survive as businesses, we have to, we have to work in a commercial setting. Um, uh, the, the, the BAME community in the UK uh, is a rapidly growing sector, I think, I think sector, I mean, uh, 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 element within the uh, population. And I think that um, it, it doubled in the last 30 years, sort of spending power of around 300 billion pounds. I mean, it's, 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 it makes no sense to at best ignore and at worst alienate um, uh, uh, an incredibly thriving and exciting part of who we are. So. Um, I agree with everything you're saying, and I think that it is important also now that we're getting statistics in, we're getting um, we're getting real data we can use to, to actually defend why we know it's the right thing to do. But um, it's incredibly helpful to have that data behind us. Hi, um, thanks for having me here. Um, so, as a translator, but um, also as a, a, a parent and um, and a reader of children's books, um, I suppose I'm quite idealistic about the purpose of children's books. Um, that it's uh, for children to explore the world, to to see a reflection of themselves, and to sort of, for children to grow up um, uh, having more confidence in their identity or their difference, whatever that difference might be. Um, but also, um, children's books, offer, well, as, as do adults' books, offer us a chance to see other perspectives on the world, other um, cultural values, other um, uh, just ways of life. And I think we uh, we all know that we are, have the Equalities Act, we have legal structures, and we have a lot of talk about equality and diversity um, in the UK, but you know, in other countries as well. And and yeah, I think children can see when that isn't genuinely the case um, and I think um, uh, for me part of the idealism of, of publishing and of education is um, is really enacting social mobi mobility and giving children the, the chance to see that other ways of living are possible other experiences are valid um, equally valid and you know, and, and, and perhaps by learning more about other cultures, somehow we can change the world. <laughs> you know, these are big questions, but um, yeah, I do think that um, uh, experience of other cultures helps us analyse and and, um, and and quantify what what works in our own culture as well. Thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Greet from Book Island. I started my company in 2012 um, in New Zealand, where I used to live with my small children and just like Della Ram, I started um, in publishing because I was very frustrated with the lack of diverse titles for children. Um, being Belgian myself, I had grown up with um, amazing children's books from around the world in translation. In Belgium we, we read a lot in translation and I didn't realize until I moved to New Zealand that only 3% of the books here, or maybe it's 4 now. Uh, 5.6 in the latest study. Oh, 5.6. Wow. Still, still a long way to go. <laughs> anyway, we're still far away from the numbers. In other countries, it's up to 50%. So I, I decided to do something about that by bringing thought-provoking and beautifully illustrated books from around the world to New Zealand and then have them translated. We now live in Bristol. Since uh, a month before the referendum, we were based there. And uh, we just try to make a difference by bringing more books into the UK. Um, because, you know, diverse books are available in other languages. We just have to translate them while we're trying to build um, a list here. Well, local publishers are trying their best to, uh, to, yeah, to change things. It's a slow process, but eventually we'll get there. Jumping off on uh, what Greet just mentioned, and we'll start going this way, um, I'd like to ask each of the participants to talk about how they find the books that they do, and also because each, each of you has a very different philosophy or way of uh, including diversity or inclusivity, uh, whether it's translating books that already exist from another language or putting together um, creators from different parts of the world, uh, uh, matching a writer and an illustrator, or sometimes a bridge where you publish some books in translation and some books um, mixing UK and diverse uh, from foreign uh, writers or um, yeah so and also if you can talk ab about as a translator whether you are um, 
scouting for books and pitching them to, to publishers as well. So if we start back this way. So with Book Island, we publish mainly in translation. And there are various ways for me to find books um, across, across the world. Um, I go to fairs like the London Book Fair, Bologna and Frankfurt and uh, meet publishers there but there are lots of other ways to find out about what's happening like when i travel i go to local bookshops see what the local publishers have translated from other parts of the world and it's uh, really important to to look into other languages and and, and i love looking across um, the channel and, and see what ha what's happening in in europe because it, the, the 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 publishers are much freer there and they ha there's also a lot more funding available, so there's space for exper experiments, and I really love that. I, r I really want to bring that over here. Um, so I would say these are my main channels to find uh, new books, and I also depend on my literary translators, and I can see fight quite a few here today. So um, uh, translators are scouting for me, and often, even though I'm always looking around for new titles, they will have seen a book that I have missed and they play a very important role for me. They, they're really my, my ambassadors and they help me a lot uh, in showing new titles to me. We're actually just, um, we've received funding. We're from the European Union, from Creative Europe. We're probably the last British um, U or UK children's publisher who will receive funding. Um, and uh, my translators really helped me to, to select three titles. Um, so these are like the main channels for me. Um, so as a translator, I um, personally haven't pitched many books. And in the last year or so, like all my work has been um, publishers coming to me. So I felt incredibly lucky that so many of the books that I've worked on have actually just been exactly up my street. So um, one German book I translated last year, well, came out last year, um, Apple Cake and Baklava, was about a Syrian family arriving in Germany. So it was about immigration, about, um, well, about being a refugee and about um, uh, the difficulty of settling into a new culture and um, communication. Um, um, so yeah, books like that and, and some other um, Arabic um, children's uh, picture books which um, Daft Publishers are going to be bringing out this year are some of the first um, picture books to be ever to be translated from Arabic. So there have been some but still very, very few. Um, and they're the first from Syria. Um, uh, but yeah, in coming months I'm hoping to do more pitching and I'm always looking out for books. and. Um, in terms of diversity, I personally sort of see it not um, just about um, ethnic or, or religious or cultural diversity, but also um, I'm really keen to um, to support and um, you know, work on more books um, that explore um, uh, sexuality and gender. And I personally believe that um, it's never too young for children to also um, get used to the idea that there are gay people in your family or elsewhere, you know, for um, us to get used to the idea that people can have two female parents. So I don't know if Lawrence is going to show his book, but like, um, he's um, the author of a wonderful children's book, uh, picture book, um, which you know, is not necessarily about um, having a queer a family member, but it's just in the background. And so I'm really interested in um, books which not necessarily have like as a central theme, um, difference or like diversity um, but it's dealt with in the book somehow in the background so whether it's like characters that are also disabilities something I'm very interested in not necessarily um, only about having dis a disabled character or a deaf character as the main character but also just having them just generally populating novels more it's just um, we you know they do exist but there's not many um, and also I do really worry uh, well, as well. I, I have um, the deaf children who wear hearing aids, and you, we, of course, been looking out for books with deaf characters, and they're still very few and far between. And, and there's one wonderful one which I've just finished reading, um, Max and the Millions. Um, but you know, the, the first chapters sort of start off with the difficulty of his life, and I was like, just because he's got hearing aids, or just because he's deaf, do we you don't have to make it all difficult? You know? And of course, it comes out good in the end, and he does have superhero powers. But um, Basically, I'm always looking for books which sort of challenge those, those perceptions of, um, of, of being different, whether it's culturally, religious, uh, or, or, or physical difference. Um, so for us, we, we, we primarily uh, publish original, originated uh, books. Um, we work with authors and illustrators from lots of different uh, cultural backgrounds, but lots of different countries as well. I think our, we, we've worked with authors and illustrators 
whose heritage stems from around 28 countries or something so far, and obviously we're just trying to expand that. We've recently moved into translations. We've, we, we published our first translation last year, um, and we're doing our second this year. So we're sort of a novice at that, but find that really exciting. Um, I think for us, where we find our stories, it's, it's, it's a whole mix. Uh, we, we have an open submissions process on our website, which I know not, not all publishers do. We find it invaluable. I mean, there's a, you know, it takes a lot of time to, to look through lots of submissions, but you, know, you can find some absolute gems. And I think we do a lot of uh, editorial work. We take things, if we see you know, there's even just a concept or, or something we like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work. Um, really closely with that illustrator to, or author to, to, to bring their idea to life. Um, uh, very often we work with debut authors, so it's, it's often a case of sort of um, really sort of bringing that out and nurturing that, and hopefully sort of setting them on a path to uh, to publishing sort of more widely. Um, we also look. I'm also sort of trying. Uh, uh, I'm very interested in what's being published in different countries. Uh, we have also worked with authors who are prize-winning and amazing and wonderful in other places, but just haven't had any opportunity to publish here. Um, and so we we look at things like curated book lists, uh, uh, things like the White Ravens uh, on a list, which I find brilliant. It's just a fun read as much as anything. Um, and. Um, I see, I see Deborah and Alex over there, outside in world and, and what they do, all their lists. There's lots and lots of wonderful people out there and lots of resources if you do want to sort of look more widely. Um, and I think just in the main, we're interested in translating cultures as much as we are languages, which actually I think might be something I, I might talk about a bit later on a different question. But, but it's, it's uh, yeah, that idea that we can, it's more than just, just language. We're actually sort of bringing different cultures and making them accessible in, in, in different ways. Uh, yeah, for us, we, we started with uh, translated books and uh, we were lucky that we knew many uh, good artists and good books uh, that were published in Iran and um, well, they have um, actually beautiful books and uh, very talented artists there. And uh, so the first books we published were the books that we brought in and translated and then we thought that we needed a, a, an intercultural bridge, as we called it. So that was when we started collaborations between uh, authors and illustra illustrators from different parts of the world. The first one was um, author from the UK and illustrator from Iran. And we wanted to see how a story develops um, between them, how different they see one story. And in collaboration, the book that they made uh, was a bottle of happiness. I don't have it here, unfortunately. But it was, um, I can say, a different kind of book as you wouldn't expect the illustrations to be as they were. Um, we continued these collaborations and uh, we are publishing stories from um, all other cultures. We have a series called One Story, Many Voices, which is um, fairy tales and folk tales that were um, told from different cultural perspectives. So the first one was, uh, was Cinderella of the Nile, and that was uh, a Greek-Egyptian Cinderella told thousands of years ago, maybe before the European version. Um, and uh, we're continuing that. We have another book coming soon, that is Phoenix of Persia. This is uh, the story of Phoenix that we have in um, many different cultures, again, Firebird. And, uh, and some parts of the story is also um, a little bit similar to Snow White, um, but it's from a thousand year old story, again, from Iran. And it's told, um, a British author has retold the story and uh, Iranian illustrator has illustrated this one. And we also have included music in it, so there's original music coming out with it. So again, this one was a unique kind of book that uh, happened to us because um, we came to uh, this book from music perspective. A musician contacted us and said that she had um, something in her mind to um, introduce Iranian instruments and music, but in a story like something like Peter and the Wolf, to introduce each character as an instrument, but in a traditional Iranian story. So this is how this book came about. 
So this is a little bit about how we uh, gather books. We have many other sort of books, but this one is very different. Again, um, it's about the drum, but um, um, author from Zimbabwe and illustrator from Switzerland. So, yeah, different ways. So, um, just as you know, the, the many ways that diversity can happen in the books, and you know, the, the panelist is a good example of a lot of different strategies. Um, and it, one thing I think is interesting is even the publishers that generally started by just translating existing books have started creating their own books using um, writers and illustrators from very different backgrounds, so that they're not just taking one culture. Uh, it's not necessarily a pair where both the writer and the illustrator are from the same background. They're, they're creating unique amalgams um, of that intersection. So, um, and that sort of ties into the next thing I wanted to ask. Um, the UK is not a monolingual country. There are many languages other than English, including but not limited to Welsh, Scottish, Gaelic, Irish, British Sign Language, and Cornish, all of which are officially recognized here by the UK government. Um, not to mention that there are many quote unquote, immigrant languages that are spoken and learned by children and adults um, at home, in school, in their communities. So I wanted to ask the panelists to talk about um, either any multilingual projects that you're involved with. Um, I know that, uh, well, I would say Babel Babies, you say Babel Babies. Um, uh, whether you do any translation workshops, whether those of you who translate books from other languages, whether one of the things that you do is to talk about that, or whether there's demand for the original language editions of the books after you've published, you know, so like with The Little Black Fish, does that then create demand for the original book to also be brought in or some of the other languages? So if we can go back this way and talk about it. Okay, this is a very interesting topic actually. We, um, when we started Tiny Owls, the first thing that I thought was to publish bilingual books. But uh, we decided against it because we thought our books as it is are considered as niche and we don't want that. And just putting two different languages in a book makes it more desirable somehow. I don't know why, I don't feel that way, but um, many families, many children will think that this book is not for them. So uh, we didn't want to do that, so we decided to print in English. But then we had um, many requests or demands from um, other people to have the books in another language, in their original language some, sometimes, again, or... Um, but um, we are not publishing it in any other languages, but we have thought about going digital for some of them. It's not confirmed yet, but this is something that we are thinking about. Maybe this is a way to do it, but I don't know. Um, I mean, so we, we've worked, uh, we, we had this lovely um, collaboration, uh, I think it was last year before, uh, where a, a Croatian publishing house came to us. Um, is Vori Publishing, and they uh, wanted to use one of our books, The Jasmine Sneeze, which has been, which was written by our Syrian author Nadine Kadan, um, and to to create bilingual editions to uh, use to, uh, in schools and public libraries with uh, refugee children who are coming into Croatia and uh, we uh, and and a few other countries. Um, so they published in in uh, German, Arabic, um, Arabic. Slovenian and Arabic Croatian um, and it's, uh, it's just sort of amazing seeing that journey from a book which started off in one language and has ended up in four uh, or, or whatever it might be um, and I mean obviously the process of publishing very often is one of selling rights into other languages so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of that kind of uh, um, uh, you know, relationships and arrangements happening anyway, um, which I always, you know, that, that moment when a book comes back to you in a different language is always incredibly exciting. But I think in this particular project, um, working uh, with, with refugee children and uh, in, in, work in a school, they put on a play of the book. You know, there's just lots of lovely things that came from that particular relationship. So, um, yeah, we, we, we would love to do more of that kind of things as well. Brilliant. Um, I want to say something about the sort of collaboration I've done with um, uh, Nadine, one of um, the authors at Lantana, but I'll come to it in a second. I'm going to go about it in a roundabout way. Um, um, yeah, you, uh, I'm sure anyone who's interested in languages will know what a, a kind of crisis we have in this country is going back years, decades. 
decades, a kind of disrespect for languages and a failure to sort of work out how we should teach languages or how to engage young people in um, uh, in attempting to learn another language. And, and it's just such an ironic situation given that we are such a multilingual country that so many kids in so many schools have um, a home language or community language or something which um, really we should be capitalising on and should encourage children to grow up feeling proud of their bilingual nature and uh, of that extra um, extra brain power they have as a result of being able to sort of, um, speak in two languages. Um, but yeah, rather than being seen as an asset, that gets left behind at the school and it's, you know, um, kids um, who sort of newly arrive in the UK are are dealt with as EFL and English as, a, as an additional language, EAL, or um, as, as having a handicap somehow, when actually you know, they have a lot to, to, um, to bring culturally and not to mention sort of cognitively. Um, and so um, for that reason, but also other reasons, um, um, I um, co-founded a um, company called Babel Babies and I'm the director, I'm not so actively involved in it now because translation's taken over, but um, it started out as a music group locally where we live in Cheltenham and it sort of spread um, to Bristol and for, for a while it was in Manchester doing uh, weekly music sessions for um, families with toddlers and babies um, and then um, also working more in nurseries and, and, and now starting to work more in primary schools um, and we it's about singing and reading stories in as many languages as possible um, and it sounds a bit crazy and overwhelming and when people first come to a session they're like oh we're actually going to sing songs in eight languages <laughs> um, but yeah really the principle is um, um, spreading um, a love and enjoyment of, of languages and curiosity about other cultures and, and really just putting languages and um, people's experiences on an equal footing because in the, in the UK certainly when you talk about foreign languages or ex exploring the world in most terms it's, it's reduced to learning French, German or Spanish and really it's reduced to what can we teach, not like what should we teach or what should we encourage children to teach each other but just what could we possibly teach. Um, and so yeah, we want to sort of shake that up a little bit and, um, and we really believe in um, the, the real sort of emotional um, and sort of social aspect of um, doing music and stories together. And um, I think in children's publishing, I think um, live events and author visits are absolutely critical to um, a book success and to um, sort of engaging children, you know, whether it's like really young ones or like in the junior or older. Um, I know certainly my boys, they want to buy the books for the, one, the authors that they met at school. I mean, we're really lucky. We live in Cheltenham where there's a wonderful literature festival. And, and so our, my sons have perhaps unusually met or seen quite a lot of authors. Um, but that, that aspect is really important. Um, so one thing I was really proud that we did last year was um, a Babel Babies collaboration with um, Nadine Kardan, who's um, an author who's published, two books are published by Lantana, um, and she's a Syrian author, Nadine, and uh, she came, we did an event called Singing for Syria, and, and um, I'm also involved with um, Children Welcomes Refugees, which is a sort of a grounds roots organisation for supporting um, uh, refugees who have come um, on the um, Syrian um, uh, resettlement programme. Um, and we did this wonderful event where we read the stories together um, in English and in Arabic and the audience was made up of both um, Syrian um, children but also English children and for both it was such a kind of transformative experience for the English kids hearing something about the war in Syria, something about the difficulty of moving to a different country, just the joy of hearing another language for the first time, having an, uh, yeah, an opportunity to hear something other than French. <laughs> Or like something that seems very exotic, but actually they realise it's you know, just another language, it's just another, um, another way of life. Um, and for the Syrian children, it was so reassuring and um, I can't think of the word, um, but just the experience of um, meeting a role model, meeting somebody who's come from your culture, who's arrived in the UK, um, you know, in exile from. Um, uh, from a war zone, I think that she came to the UK before um, the war started, but um, coming from another culture and becoming a published author in, in English, uh, you know, she was such a role model and um, to kids, but, and also that event gave them the opportunity to talk about stuff that they don't get to talk about in the school day, it just, it's not part of the, the curriculum. So yeah, I really believe in those kind of collaborative events and I'd like to do more. <laughs> So uh, at uh, Book Island, I've, I've been looking at ways to publish bilingual books, just like Delaram. I'm, I'm really dreaming about this, but it's really difficult when you work in translation, especially when you 
publish illustrated books because the books were not conceived to to hold a lot of text and we just can't squeeze in an extra language so we could we could make it work by creating our own titles and I think I think that's something I really want to work on in the future but when it comes to languages um, just like you I'm really shocked at how um, the government has been treating a language education here because there's such a such a wealth of languages in the country but nothing is really done with it um, when I when I go into schools in, in mainly in Bristol I talk a lot about translation but also about languages and I always try to involve the children in the group because I know that there will be at least about 35 40 percent of the children will speak a different language at, at home and they're usually a bit shy about that they usually uh, especially when they speak uh, the real minority languages they 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 really think that English is the most important language but I'm trying to tell them that actually they should be really proud of their second or it's usually or their first language and then some of these children speak three or even four languages but the school is not doing anything with that they're not celebrating it so my talk is very often about that um, and I also really uh, make them think about translation and how they maybe become a translator later or an interpreter um, and, and use their languages as an asset and not as a handicap um, so when I when I went in um, for World Book Day last week, we did a little, little uh, activity with the children about translation and how they could find a translator in the book. And I first took them back to my own childhood and I told them about the books that I had read. And I had a, a selection of six books and I knew they were going to know them because they were big international bestsellers like Pippi Longstocking, The Famous Five. And I had them all in Dutch. I had the covers in Dutch on the, on the screen. And at first they looked a bit bewildered, like, what is this? You know, she's not going to talk in Dutch to us, is she? <laughs> um, but then we just had the discussion about how important it is to bring um, other cultures into, into the UK through literature. And I think it was really a mind-blowing experience for them. And it, at the end of the, of the activity, we we uh, really looked inside all the books I, I brought along and they were looking for the names and uh, and I think in the future they will always wonder whether the book they're reading is maybe is it really written by a UK author as they thought or is it maybe coming from from elsewhere and I know this is I'm doing this on a very very small scale but I I do think it makes a difference could they work out what the books were from the Yes. So yeah, we we, um, we do a little guessing game as well because I've got other covers too. So I show them our Book Island titles in the UK um, edition and the original edition. And I always ask the head of the school first which languages are going to be uh, in the group. And then I always try to pick a Portuguese book if I know there's a Brazilian child or um, maybe there's a German uh, child or a, a child that speaks Arabic at home. And, and they, you can just see how those children are just, they're so proud that they actually the only one in the whole group who can say this is, this is Brazilian Portuguese or just Portuguese. It just makes a really big difference for them. And I, I love doing that guessing game with them. So I was, the next question is to ask the panelists about um, promoting the works uh, either in translation or these diverse multicultural projects. Um, are there additional difficulties or are there in fact advantages that publishers have, um, you know, uh, Book Island which has just published a, a Latvian picture book, whether there's a, a Latvian community that then is an additional market outside of the traditional um, so, and also the, how the, I mean, each of the panelists has very different um, approaches to inclusion and diversity. So, sort of um, to explore how these different strategies um, are received in the marketplace by booksellers, reviewers, schools, and readers. Um, just as an example, though, as a translator from Spanish into English, um, a lot of times I find when I'm pitching Latin American projects, especially to American publishers, I get a lot of pushback if the books are not about Latino identity. So it's very difficult for me to just have uh, a good sci-fi young adult novel written by a Latin American author and convince a publisher to take that on, especially in the US, because they're like, it's not about Latinidad, you know, why would we want to translate a book if it's not about these cultural identity markers? And especially since so many of you are, are trying to break down all of these borders to see how the books are being um, accepted. 
Okay, well, um, let me start with diversity. I think uh, one of our obstacles in selling books that are diverse is that they are not exposed enough. So you won't see them usually on the shelves in the bookshops. Not all bookshops, but um, you know that when you go to the chains, usually you see, and that's mainly, maybe that's because most of the books are not diverse. But when we have a few of them, I think um, there's a need for exposure to show them, to showcase them, and to drive more interest towards them. And then th that helps to publish more books like that and uh, to, to change the scene a little bit. Or media coverage, but there's very little media coverage for children's books anyway, but even less for diverse books. So that's another thing that we really want to change. So um, in Tiny Al, we started a campaign, Diversity Now, and we use the hashtag, hashtag Diversity Now. And I would like to ask you, everyone, to uh, what, what we are doing is to, if you find a bookshop that is showcasing a diverse book, please take a picture and use the hashtag and shout about it, because that really helps. I think we can make a change. Um, yeah, so I think I would emphasize on that and let the other panelists talk about it. <laughs> well, I think it's, I mean, it's really interesting what you're doing, and, that's, and that I think it's really important. And we're at a point where, for better or worse, we do need to shout about diversity as a particular thing in itself. Diversity, inclusion, we need those labels still. Obviously, we're working towards a world where they no longer need to exist. I always think about it in terms of our own business, um, our, our, our vision versus our mission. So the, the wider vision is to have a world where we don't need to exist, right? So technically, we would put ourselves out of business if, if, if that world were to come about. I think it's going to take quite a long time, so I think we might, we might be around for a while longer. But, but the point is that um, it, it, we want diverse books and inclusive books and books that are celebrating um, uh, or everything that's not mainstream to be considered mainstream. We don't want them to be put ultimately in a box of themselves. However, at this stage, I think we are at the point where we do need to, we need to really push to say these are different, they're here, they exist, they need to be celebrated. Um, I mean, in terms, just, just briefly, in terms of our, um, so to, to your point about the Latino culture, um, we, we tend to produce three different types of, of books. So one would be uh, a window onto another culture. So it might be set in another country. It might be, it might, it might, uh, be celebrating something specific to, to one particular culture. Um, or, we, or books that, are, that just happen to feature characters of color um, in, a, in, a, you know, in London or a Western city. Um, the, the third type is books that are about whatever the author wants to write about. And, um, and uh, we, we've done one particular uh, set of books, actually. There are three books in the series now um, by author um, uh, Chitra Soundar and um, illustrator Poonam Mystery. And the, the, books, the, the, book, uh, the first book was called You're Safe With Me, and it was about a, a mama elephant and some, and some, some baby, elephants in a, uh, baby animals in a forest. Um, and the next book um, we, uh, was called You're Snug With Me, and so we wanted to set it in somewhere, in sort of, you know, somewhere cold and snug, and so, so, um, uh, so we set it in the Arctic. And, and Chitra said that that book was the first book she's ever been allowed to write uh, as an Indian author, an author of Indian heritage, that wasn't set in India or related to Indian culture in any way. And she just said, and I didn't know this at the time, it, it didn't even cross my mind <laughs> that this was something weird or out there, but, like, uh, but she mentioned it at one point and just said that's, that was the first ever opportunity I had. And I just thought, gosh, it's crazy. And I, but I can, understand, I can understand why, you know, you know I, can, I can see how these customs grow up, but I think we need to work against them as well, and I think that's actually very important. Mm -hmm. Totally, and think what a role model that is to kids who, who see Chitra when she comes into school and does events like the Indians are allowed to talk about the Antarctic, don't just have to comment on their own culture. Yeah, so, yeah we absolutely need this kind of um, multicultural diversity, and it seems ironic that we don't have in this country. But um, and I think it's such a, I haven't got much more to add, but um, so important um, what you said about social media and about the difficulty of having getting children's books reviewed. Full stop. You know, children's publishing is a massive part of the, the market in the UK, um, but has disproportionately few reviews in the mainstream papers. I suppose because there are 
limited number of reviewers who feel competent to write about books. But I mean, the people are out there, they're just not getting paid to write the reviews. Um, happily, we have organizations like Outside in World who review um, uh, children's books, particularly books in translation. Um, and um, in terms of uh, um, translated books, um, Eurokid, no, so what's called European Literature Network, also occasionally reviews children's books. So there, there are places, there are, and of course, masses of blogs, and happily, lots of um, education scholars, academics, um, who, uh, who are promoting um, diverse books translation. But you know, a lot of that is happening online, and you don't see it so much. In the, um, a lot of the the, the most interesting um, books in translation are like diverse books that are looking at other cultures are small independent presses who have um, find it very difficult to get their books in the in the mainstream bookshops or bookshop in the, <laughs> the monopoly that almost exists in the UK. Um, so yeah, the, um, blogs and, and social media is massively important. And so as translators, there's a few of us who are doing our little bit to kind of help promote um, uh, translated literature and, and we run a Twitter account called World Kid Lit and we've also got a blog where we try and just um, raise awareness of, of books that have come out and uh, you do re reviews and like, interviews with translators, interviews with publishers and so on. It's still quite a mini affair, quite early days, but um, this, if, on the blog is already quite an impressive amount of stuff. Oh yeah, and we saw um, uh, Lawrence and Marcia who's, uh, and Alexandra Bookler who sort of started the initiative um, uh, sort of suggested September as World Kid Lit Month, which, uh, one month when we really shout about um, global books and global perspectives. Um, so, yeah, that's a thing that we try and talk about all year round as well. Being on this panel today, I, I'm actually starting to feel quite positive about our future. <laughs> I, think, um, I think if we had started what we're doing 10 years ago, it wouldn't have worked. But I really think there's, things are moving and there's a need for the books that we publish. And we'll, we'll get there eventually, but we, we have a problem with the exposure. As you, as you mentioned, you know, the, we really need to get the bookshops on board. And but at the same time, um, there's also a new trend of um, customers, followers who buy from us direct, who just don't, they know they won't find our books in their local bookshops. So they've just given up on them and they just they know we exist and they will come direct to us. They also know that this helps us tremendously just to have these direct sales and it's really good for us to have a, a direct conversation with, with the followers and to hear what they need. Um, like we, we know, we just published a picture book about grief, Mum's Jumper, and um, before, so this is, this is the cover, it's not available yet uh, in the bookshops but you can buy it directly from us. Um, we knew from our followers that this, this topic is really important and that it should be, we should have more publications, more children's books um, around it, but it's, the bookshops are often gatekeepers as well. And they just think, oh, this is not gonna sell. Um, yeah, I don't really want it here. But we do know from social media, and social media is very powerful for us, that there is a, a big need for, for this. So I'm hopeful, we can, we can do this. So I just wanted to mention one anecdote related to the, the story you told about Tida. Um, so aside from being a writer and a translator, I've also edited a lot of anthologies. And um, back in the 90s, I edited a fantasy anthology, which happens, I'm an openly gay man. Um, it happens to have three LGBT stories. Um, it has three LGBT authors, but those are not the authors of those stories. And so what happens is that very often, I've, I had been asked for years in the genre um, to always write the LGBT story for this fantasy or sci-fi anthology, and the authors that were also included were always asked to specifically write something LGBT, and since I didn't ask them that, they didn't, you know, they wrote uh, heterosexual stories in this case, um, whereas the non-LGBT writers knew that I would be open to these stories that they never, um, at the time, had never dared to write because they didn't think that any of their editors would be receptive. So, um, and this sort of ties into you know, a lot of the stuff also that Ruth was saying. Um, since translation and the multicultural approach that all of the panelists are um, taking in their project is all about breaking down bar barriers and borders and making culture more accessible um, and diverse, what are some of the ways that each of you have found community within the UK for these projects? So we're trying to also 
not just be doom and gloom that you know there there are ways that we are making these projects happen and finding receptive uh, audiences for them. Uh, I can I can name many good friends that are working with us and um, I appreciate all of the efforts. Um, I just want to um, before that mention that uh, it's a, there's a good vibe for diversity right now but and I hope that it continues but um, well it needs us and uh, it's not, um, it not it's not something that you can say hundred percent is going to change unless we decide to change ourselves. So yeah, I would like to thank many good friends like Book Trust, Letterbox Library, like uh, the little book, what is it? Uh, box of books, the little box of books, uh, which is a subscription service. And uh, yeah, CLP, we have many good uh, communities and friends that are working with us and helping with the diversity. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I echo those thanks. I mean, uh, champions are incredibly important to us. When we're small and we don't have big advertising budgets or, and, and we don't have a lot of exposure in, in media, in shops, um, yeah, to have those people who really care about what we do and who want to write about us and, and tweet about us and all the rest is, is incredibly important. Um, I think, sort of speaking to Greep's point from before, I mean, I hadn't quite, I mean, this is a bit silly running a publishing house, but I hadn't quite realized how much, uh, how much of a, a, a business to business, a B2B business publishing is. We sell books to suppliers and to wholesalers who sell on to bookshops or schools or libraries who sell on to customers. There's a very long chain um, and it's actually very difficult to reach that end customer that per in fact even I mean the child is the one step even further um, to actually know exactly what they want to read what, what what they think is missing what's exciting them what they love about our books or other people's books and and I think that that's what makes publishing as much as anything an incredibly um, challenging I'll say challenging not difficult uh, industry um, to work in but there are lots of possibilities when you build up a community around you in other ways so um, you're talking about selling direct or at least just having people come direct to you um, I think that 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 it, it, it helps in lots of ways um, and but also uh, yeah to build up a, a sort of social media presence or to do something like uh, uh, you know nights off have done with all their pop-ups I mean there's some, some really exciting ways to go and actually meet your readers and it's it's and it's so important for the authors themselves I think as well to be able to feel that there's that engagement there um, so um, yes the importance of community basically around what we do mm. um, yeah I think um, uh, for me, like in terms of finding um, books that I want to read to my kids or I want to, um, to have <laughs> in my life, um, it's a lot is social media, so um, Twitter and, and blogs. And it might be a bit of a cliche, and, but I think uh, the sort of national events like Refugee Week, Black History Month, uh, World Book Day, they all have a really big role to play in terms of putting um, books by small indie presses on a, on a sort of level playing field with the really big publishers um, whose books are out there in the bookshops already anyway. Um, so um, one of the books I did uh, last year, or I've already mentioned, Apple Cake and Backlover, which was about with um, Daft Publishers, you've got really tiny minuscule um, uh, publish, uh, pu publicity budget, if you know, any budget at all, um, but just by writing to, um, helping them write to um, blog authors and line up a blog tour of reviews over the course of Refugee Week, gave that book so much more exposure than it might have got through any other means. Um, and so working with indie presses, I've sort of dabbled a little bit in book publicity and realised you know, what a massive undertaking it is and what a difficult job it is to get books seen when there is so much competition in the field um, and so many books, you know, especially with such big publishers sort of dominating the field. Uh, but yeah, I do think that things like Black History Month yeah. has got such an important role to play in terms of not just um, promoting um, non-fiction and history, not um, non-fiction stories, but also using the importance of history, um, sorry, bringing in fiction as well, I think a lot more, and, and more creative workshops in schools. You know, there is stuff done, but 
there's still a, a real gap for resources, for lesson plans, for uh, workshops, um, or looking at, at, at fiction and, and more creative ways of engaging with, with black history, for example. Because, um, as I just said before, everything I do is on such a small scale, because actually Book Island is just me. Um, I'm always reaching out for people in the community who can help me, and I've recently realized that teachers are incredibly important for me. Um, because they, they will teach over a thousand children in their career and they're very, very active on Twitter, especially here in the UK. They, there are so many passionate primary school teachers who would spend their entire um, salary on, on beautiful picture books and share those with the children. So um, I'm really focused on them at the moment. And I also know that they are often very loyal to their independent bookshops. So they're very much on, my, on the same page as me. So this is what I'm working on. I would also say, you know, I mean, even though Greet was just saying, it's just me, you know, I'm just so small, my small scale, but um, all of the publishers, which are, you know, small, you know, one or, or few people projects are having a global impact. Not only are they bringing mm -hmm. translations of books into the English language in the UK market, um, or creators from all over the world and diverse backgrounds here in the UK, but all three of the publishers also distribute on, in other countries as well as in the UK. So I'd just like um, if the panelists can also talk about how the books are received, for instance, because you do it in New Zealand and Australia as well, and mm -hmm. I know that Lantana and Tiny Owl are now also both in the US market. What are the differences between how these books are received uh, in the UK home market and abroad? If mm. you start so um, Book Island is now distributed in over 30 countries. It sounds huge and it sounds like I'm making a lot of money, yeah. but it basically means that books are being shipped to um, gift shops, be beautiful bookshops in, let's say, Johannesburg, and maybe it's just two copies going there. I'm, I'm, a I'm starting to feel a little bit bad about this because I don't think this whole global economy works really well when you think about the impact it has on, on our climate, maybe, and, uh, and other things. I actually, I'd much rather have a community here in the UK a bigger community here so that we don't have to export because I think we are exporting so much because we don't reach enough people here. We don't get enough exposure here. And it sounds really glamorous to have all these countries on our list, but I'd rather have a bigger impact here. Now, it's interesting to see how our books are being received um, in all those different cultures. And sometimes a particular book about grief will do really well in Scandinavia and a picture book about uh, nature will maybe go down very well in, in New Zealand. So it is, it's, you're basically putting your eggs in different baskets, which is a great thing. We, we reach many different um, outlets and, and cultures. But I really i am starting to feel that I don't want to be supporting this model much longer. So the US is, is, one of the con is one of the markets we're not in and I probably won't go to, even though they will really appreciate what we're doing. And it's mainly because of that concern that I have. I think we have to, like, I'm also printing in Europe now. I'm not printing in China anymore, in Latvia. And that's much closer to the UK. I feel much better about that. And if I could just stop shipping our books to all the corners of the world, I would feel even better. So, sorry um, if I'm spoiling it for you guys. <laughs> it's diverse just, opinions. Okay. Okay. The publishers for this. Stuff. Yeah, um, no, actually, it's so interesting you're saying that, Greg, because um, you know, we, we're actually in a similar position. We sell all over the world now. Um, we, the, the, the two established uh, distribution and sales. Um, outfits, I guess, uh, for want of a better word, are here in the UK and the US. The US, in fact, is now by far our biggest market. I think we generated 75% of our revenue last year from the States. So obviously, it's a huge part of what we do. And it's incredibly important in lots of ways we do that. It's a much, much bigger market. There's just so many more people for one. Um, we actually signed our contracts with our US distributor on the day that Trump was inaugurated. Um, 
and I suddenly got worried. You know, these are very diverse, multicultural books. Um, uh, what, what will they say? And actually, the sales team over there said that was literally the best thing that could have ever happened to you because now these people really need your books, you know, and some people are going to really fight for them. Um, so I find, I mean, I find the US market interesting. It, they receive our books in general very well. Um, we had a bit of a funny... Um, uh, sort of scenario right at the start when, when we were doing publicity materials um, around what we were going to call ourselves as a sort of as, as, an in, as, as a publisher over there. Um, I don't mean our name. I mean what was going to be said about us. And um, and the the, the the marketing team over there said uh, uh, kept on putting the word folk tales in the in the blurb. And I said, oh, but we we don't actually <laughs> we don't publish folk tales. We never publish the folk tale. Um, and they were like, no, no, no. But you know that you know that that word's going to appeal to people. And I'm like, yeah, but it literally doesn't. Exist you know, doesn't describe anything we do. So in the end, we compromised on modern fables or something, but it was very much something they wanted to keep, that idea of, you know, the rest of the world. It's, I don't know, for better or worse, um, it's, it, that's sort of the way that they, 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 they look at us over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, in some extent, you know, we've, we've done very well. So, you know, um, you know, had some books on the was well, the that's outstanding that's international that's book list. So we're seen as sort of an international, we're very much an international voice over there. And, that, and that's absolutely fine. Um, I actually can I just have one so one example just because you talk about sort of uh, outside one then I'll, I'll stop um, talking but um, we had one book that we published here um, called the Amuchi Pucci so it's one of our early books it was um, by an Indian poet um, and actually we really struggled to sell it here it was longer than the traditional book sort of I don't know 1,500 words or something as opposed to 300 that you're meant to have um, and it was about grief it was about bereavement it's about a grandmother dying it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever read and I just had to had to publish it um, and yes as I said it, it barely sold but then what was funny was that four years was it four years or I don't know three two three four years later um, Penguin Random House India um, somehow came across it and they decided to buy uh, uh, English uh, intercontinental Indian intercontinental rights in English um, and the book oh my gosh it's gone on to be I think it, it reached number four on the fiction bestseller list across adult and children's titles in the entire of India and the author's been um, uh, nominated for best writer of the year and just all these amazing things happen they've sold in hundreds and thousands of copies so so I think what's interesting for us is that maybe a book um, doesn't necessarily find its market in one place but it could possibly mean a huge amount no, to no. children or you know in another place um, and it really found its mark there where the author was from so yeah it's just a, it, you never know how these things are going to work out yeah, I kind of understand what Greek is saying, but uh, I think we are more like Lantana at the moment. <laughs> and uh, you said that uh, you signed the contract when Trump was coming in power. Just imagine what we would think <laughs> as some, um, as a publisher that is considered um, as Iranian or publishing more books that are related to Iran in a way. Uh, so it was a big risk, yeah, and we are just uh, starting. Actually, our first book is coming out next month in America, so we don't know. Let's hope for best. <laughs> but uh, but yes, we had some books that were sold better in uh, Australia. Um, that was the new baby and me. This is a big family of five children waiting for the sixth one. Um, and I just guess that that's something that's more appealing to people in Australia, and I don't know why. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that book was okay here, but uh, we didn't expect it to be that much better, actually, over there. Uh, yes, I agree that some books are um, more appealing in other places, so it's... It's, it's, I feel it's good to have them and, uh, and see how they um, relate to children and families in other places. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say though, I do absolutely um, think that Greet's point about the environment environmental impact about what we do is incredibly important and I am we, we moved to printing in the in, in Europe as well in order to try and cut down that that huge amount of transportation across the world um, mm -hmm. and yeah and we're trying very hard to think how we can make our practices more sustainable because but yeah that's all I want to say but it's important. Can I I just wanted to follow on from 
um, what Alice was saying about um, how a book um, could sell really well in India uh, and not in another country and how, how limited um, I think we are in the UK by um, sort of prejudices about what a children's book is, about how long a picture book should be, um, how much text should be on the page, um, how we have a real lack in the... Um, uh, of graphic novels and, and, like, and longer picture books for kind of primary readers about you know, how you, children are sort of expected to migrate from picture books to, to suddenly um, fairly long chapter books um, with relatively few pictures and, and that is a disservice to, to readers, um, I mean, especially boys who often are put off reading but, but you know, really across the board. Um, we need more diversity in our styles of narrative and, and that is a kind of it's kind of another di diversity, perhaps artistic diversity. Like, what is the story? What is a um, makes um, a book? And even uh, just in terms of like um, representation of genres, like I was a bit disappointed that um, uh, the Raven's Children, which is a, um, a chapter book, a sort of um, a middle grade um, uh, novel, which I translated for Puffin, um, and that's about um, Russian history, about the Soviet Union, set in the 1930s, and. Um, uh, it's about Soviet terror, which is a bit of a bleak issue for a children's book, but it's sort of dealt in a way that is accessible for children. And it's got sort of fantasy and um, magical realism mixed in it. And I got the impression that um, US publishers didn't take it on because it was too much of a mix of, of historical realism and fantasy, and that was a sort of an uncomfortable merging of genres. And I think, how disappointing is that? And maybe I'm not, I haven't given up hope. Hopefully we'll still find a US publisher, but... Um, you know, I think we need more creativity about like, what children could read. <laughs> so I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm going to ask for one lightning round uh, for all of the panelists. I mean, we've mentioned a few positive things along the way, but just to end um, giving kudos to someone, either a person or an institution in the UK book industry, who's doing something right or positive in the promotion of World Kid Lit and diversity. And I'll just start. I mean, Ruth had mentioned earlier also about... Um, disability and the need for more disability and so um, even though Outside In has been mentioned before they had a program called Reading the World which was books about disability from other languages that haven't yet been translated into English so they have a an, an really amazing resource of all these diverse books from all around the world that deal with dis disability, various disabilities in various ways that haven't yet uh, some of them, I think, may have, as a result of the program, been translated, but the majority of them still haven't yet. So um, that's just one of the kudos that I'll, I'll go. Why don't we just go back? Yes. I would like, I'd like to send my kudos to my colleagues here. That's really easy. Um, and I want to call out to World Book Day in the UK. They're a big charity who hand out 15 million tokens every year. These tokens are worth one pound and the children can go into a bookshop to buy a book with it. And it's amazing because lots of children don't own books. And this is often their very first book. Now, when you look at the list of books that they can choose from this year, then you won't see any diverse books on there. Also, no, no translation. So wouldn't it be wonderful if just one book on the list, just one could be diverse or translated, or maybe both. And I think, I really think we should really knock on their door um, and talk about it. We've got a year to go, so mm -hmm. next year, 2020. Yeah, putting the world back in World Book Day. It's not really about the world, exactly. is it? Exactly. <laughs> I, when I came to the UK, I couldn't believe that. I, I thought, oh, what is this World Book Day? This is really exciting. And then I just realized it was just a British initiative that is not being celebrated with the, uh, at, on the same day as the rest of the world. So basically, it's, it's British Book Day. It's not World Book Day. Um, I would very briefly mention a few things. Um, a big up for Knights Of, which is a relatively new publisher um, aiming to, to focus on um, black, Asian, and um, ethnic uh, minorities. Um, but generally I think an interesting diverse um, company. I would like to big up Daft Publishers who have um, done these um, Arabic Syrian picture books which are coming out this summer um, and are just I think considering the scale of their company being really brave sort of looking um, uh, beyond um, the UK for books. Um, a big up for Book Trust who have run um, the Another Words project for the last two years um, which is putting money into um, 
uh, helping foreign publishers or publishers uh, from the non-English speaking world to um, promote um, their children's books and, and translate samples and uh, sort of help them with pitching um, and that's led to the publication of a few books in translation um, and also great news from Book, book Trust is that um, the new writer in residence is a Filipino writer based in the UK called Candy Gourle and you know that's really great to um, have that perspective uh, on a sort of national level uh, and yeah big up for outside and world as well um, and and how the, the books from the reading in reading the way project um, not all of them have found publishers necessarily, but um, um, outside in world have um, worked um, with schools and uh, to, to run a lot of workshops. Even when the book still only uh, you know doesn't isn't published in English, is they still um, helped um, with a lot of creative initiatives to have those books read and explored and discussed in schools, um, which I think is brilliant. Yeah. So all of, all of those and. Um, uh, have we mentioned inclusive minds yet? That's another thing that Alex over there. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, you said you said in other words the book trust project as well, right? As well, um, CLPE just for doing the data. I mean, I think it's. Say what that is? Because I think everyone will know that. Oh, so they're they're um, reflecting realities report uh, um, for, from the centre centre for literacy and primary education. Um, I just think having facts and figures is so it's it's so much easier to work off when we know we have a we have a base and we can actually go to the media or whoever and say look it's this stark um you know there are a couple of amazing translators doing wonderful things like daniel hahn and um well and you and i mean just lot, lots of them actually um marsha links Quayley, i just i love what she does with her arab lit um uh, literature in english journal and she just started a um a children's yeah, one, this, right? um, yeah, a few of us, um, but definitely uh, spearheaded by Marcia, um, are working on a, um, a blog and sort of website for promoting Arabic children's books. And that's called Arabic Kid Lit. No, Arab Kid Lit now. It's just everything's just really exciting. Learning about what's happening. Um, uh, yeah, the only the last one I was going to say, Global Literature and Libraries Initiative. Actually, there are just lots. So, but I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, yes, again, all of those. <laughs> um, well, my work is easier because you. Uh, I can say that all of those I can say plus um, other publishers that are publishing diverse books that I uh, want to just um, name one of them that is a friend Alana Max so yeah I think, uh, I think there are still many but there's a few I don't know um, so we're out of time. Thank you all for coming and sharing the many diverse ways that we're um, having access to more diverse children's books in translation. As a lot of the panelists have said, they felt very, it's a very positive time and perhaps um, a good indication of this. Um, Amazon Crossing, who's the sponsor of this, um, has just started publishing children's books in translation. So I mean, this is something that's sort of a good indication that um, it's a positive, growing, successful. <laughs> um, and hopefully, you know, thanks in, in large part to the work that all of these panelists and probably many of you in the past, in the future. Thank you. Thank you.